Hello, everybody. Welcome to History Valley Podcast with your host, Jacob Berman. Today, I am joined by Dr. Rodney Blackhurst from the uh, University of La Trobe. And today, we're going to be talking about the development of Nazism, the breakaway of Nazism, uh, forming into different varieties of itself, uh, Nag Hammadi. I want to get into the Gospel of Barnabas as well and really expand on those things. I think that's it's it's very important to understand what these different Christian groups uh, believed in. And he's and he's talked extensively about this. And so we're going to be getting right into it. Um, one of the, uh, to say real quick, he offered primordial alchemy and modern religion. I'll have a link to it in the description um, below. With that being said, let's get started. Um, uh, Dr. Blockers, thanks for joining me today. Um, yeah, thank you. So Gnosticism is the view that Yaldabaoth, Yahweh, is not the true God, and that Jesus was the son of a higher God, that mm. well, the, the monad, who seems to be like a Gnostic, a, a, a Gnostic version of the Most High, the El Elyon, the uh, he appears to have been originally Yahweh's father in early mm. in an earlier form of Judaism that mm. was obliterated in form of monotheism. Um, does this seem to fit in uh, the paradigm of Jewish texts like Ferd Enoch, who uh, in which it portrays Metatron as the mm. lesser Yahweh? Mm. Yeah. Does it does it seem to have does it seem to connect to that in your view? Uh, yes, it does. But I think we have to put it into a into a much bigger bigger context here, including the Enoch literature and uh, and so on. Namely, that I think it's wrong to set up a, a simple uh, polarity between no. uh, the Jewish uh, the the Hebrew hebrews on the one hand and the 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 the, the pagan world on the other the greco hellenistic world on the other because the, there's a whole intermediate group right through the period from very early you know the, the maccabean period onwards um who are thoroughly hellenized uh jews and so so what you have there is a melding together of the semitic um religious background and its religious vocabulary um, married to very Hellenic, uh, Greek, Greco-Roman understandings of the world and philosophical frameworks and, and so forth. And I think that uh, the Gnostic, uh, Gnostic movements in general are an outcome of, of that. They're a combination of that. And so what happens there is you have um, uh, what are essentially Hellenistic frameworks put back into a Semitic environment. And so, for instance, instead of, uh, instead of uh, philosophical hierarchies, you, these become angelic hierarchies and, uh, and so forth. You get a, the, the same sort of structures, but uh, now expressed in terms of the Semitic mythologies and the Semitic worldview. Um, so that the, I think that there's definitely a connection there. The, Gnost, the later Gnosticism comes out of uh, a much earlier bedrock. It comes out of much earlier periods. But that er, that early early period is uh, where you get thoroughly Hellenized, um, thoroughly Hellenized Jews and uh, um, and other groups as well. The Hellenization of the East is very thorough from Alexander onwards. You know. And so you're going to get syncretism, in other words, you get, uh, and it reflects in all our texts from the Enoch literature all the way through, I think. Yeah. Oh, yes, I, I, I completely understand. Uh, I know it's not as simple as trying to characterize differences between uh, characterizing differences mm. and similarities, categorizing them between yeah, the Gnostic yeah, sure. Nakamani text of Ferdinand. Enoch. I know yeah. that uh, Plato, he talked about the Demiurge. Um, I know you talked about yeah. that in your book. So yeah. yeah, there are earlier Gnostic elements, but yeah. the question was framed in the sense that the Gnostic text seems to be Hellenizing the idea of mm. Ferd Enoch saying that there's two different 
Yeah, that's right. true. True, that's true. Um, and that's and that's what you would expect. You would find uh, that the Hellenizers will be going back through earlier texts looking for things they can Hellenize, and uh, that that may that may possibly be a case of it. I'm, although I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. But uh, which one? Which one? Uh, you know, which one comes first? Right. Uh, yeah, I'm not not quite sure about that. Mm. But certainly the later stuff, the later what happens later on here is is a consequence of the the hardening of the two religious communities into their uh, what become their canonical forms, namely um, the formation of the New Testament or or, or some sort of Christian orthodoxy um, and uh, and rabbinic orthodoxy forms around the same time, you know, in the second century. Um, the canon takes shape and so forth. And, and when, when that happens, when a, when a religious tradition sort of settles into a, into a canon, what happens is a whole bunch of other stuff is thrown off to the sides. It's the canonization project process in necessarily involves rejecting material. Um, and uh, that's clearly what happens here. There's a whole, whole lot of stuff which is manufactured and, and shed off as the two religious communities settle into their sort of semi-final final form. Hmm. Is it is it um, possible that first and second Enoch, which both those texts are obviously earlier than third Enoch, much earlier, could they hmm. um, could they shed light on the issue? Because both texts appear to portray Enoch as the son of man. And the son hmm. of man appears to be the second divine power or quasi divine power. Well, yeah, quasi divine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, could the earlier Enochian literature shed a light on the on this problem? Yeah, um, yeah I, I suspect it could. Mm. Um, and uh, certainly the tradition keeps dipping into that literature all the way through. Uh, you already mentioned the Gospel of Barnabas, Enoch. Mm -hmm. And all of, all of that, all of that, uh, that, that uh, walking with God ideology uh, is, is, goes all the way through that, through that tradition as well. Yes. And that takes me back to the different Gnostic groups that I was mentioning earlier. Mm. And like the, there, are, there are groups like the Mandeans. The Mandeans mm. think that John the Baptist He's the real deal. He's the Messiah. Yeah. Jesus is yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus is a nobody. Let's screw mm. that guy. Um, yeah. What do you think caused movements like that to exist? Because in the in the earliest Christian texts that we have, even mm. with Marcion and uh, um, the in the New Testament, we have. Basically, neither of those sides portrays John the Baptist as the Messiah, but he's simply the forerunner to the to Jesus, the, who is the Indeed, Messiah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. what do you think the deal is? Deal. What do you think the deal is going uh, there? Mm. Yeah, it's very hard to say what the origins of it are, isn't it? I mean, yeah. in, in lots of the symbolism, John is clearly uh, the morning star. He's identified as the morning star, effectively, who foreshadows, who, 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 you know, precedes the rising of the sun. It's sort of whether one wonders whether there's a, a sort of stellar basis to it uh, from an early period, um, namely that uh, uh, the, there's a forerunner to the rising sun, uh, you know, a, a simple sort of um, cosmological foundation for the motif like that. Um, uh, more generally, you get uh, you get combinations as as you as you find in um, uh, Shiite Islam, you get this idea that uh, revelations come in pairs, and so there's not just Moses, there's Moses and Aaron, and there's not just Muhammad, there's Muhammad and Ali, there's the there's the the lawgiver and the interpreter, uh, usually like in that like a, as a set. Um, uh, so you have that sort of uh, formation in these these religious traditions. John's not like that, though. He's not an interpreter. He's a forerunner. He's clearly a forerunner. 
Um, and in that sense, he's, he represents the old law. He represents everything in the old law that foreshadows uh, the coming of Christ. And uh, perhaps he's just a personification of that. Um, but it still doesn't explain why certain groups privilege him over Christ and even deny Christ in his name um, and so forth, the Mandeans and others. Clearly, there's a, there's a John the Baptist movement in the, from the earliest period, probably uh, uh, pre-Christianity. It comes out of, out of Second Temple Judaism. So it's a movement in Second Temple Judaism, and it continues despite Christianity. And it continues very persistently. And that, that's what we find in the Gospel of Barnabas, the medieval Gospel of Barnabas. In fact, I want to say that there's a, there's a secret tradition of Christianity that the Gospel of Barnabas represents, and we can reconstruct it from um, the clues in the Gospel of Barnabas, and it concerns uh, John the Baptist. Hmm. I find it interesting that you brought up that John the Baptist um, was portrayed by a uh, a particular denomination of Christians that, that thought of him as being the morning star. In Revelation, mm. the book of Revelation, in the final chapter, mm. Jesus is described as in earlier manuscripts as being the son of the morning star and David. Mm. In mm. most translations, it renders that way. It renders it, it renders it that way, exactly like that anyway. I think yes. the only difference is the NIV version, which has uh, attracted a lot of criticism. Mm. Um, would you say that the author of Revelation was linking Jesus to the fallen morning star in Isaiah in some way? In, in other words, linking Jesus to the rebel angels? And could that, yeah, um, could that blend in in any way? Kind of in a blender <coughs> machine. Excuse could me. that, oh, all good. Could that mm. mold together, mesh together with Marcion's mm. view of Jesus? Could, could, it, could it be that? Uh, Oh, you see, Marcion says Jesus is the enemy of mm -hmm. Yahweh. But the book of Revelation portrays Jesus as being the son yes. of uh, yeah. Lucifer. That's right. Um, all of these, I take it that all of these star revelations in this context concern the star of the East uh, prophecies from uh, and symbolism in the Torah. And and that uh, um, and that even th this this mythology is even even used by the Romans. This is the mythology that the that the Flavians adopt. The idea that the that uh, Vespasian is the star of the East, and I think Christ is portrayed as the star of the East uh, as well in that prophecy. But that's sort of a different a different symbolism to the star of the East as the forerunner. Um, so, so I think that there's sort of two layers of symbolism there to do with the, the morning star. Um, one of them is where the morning star is the forerunner and, uh, and therefore inferior to the sun itself. And, but there's another in which the rising of the, uh, the rising of the morning star is, uh, is a wholly positive, um, uh, sign you know i think i think the the the, the different symbolisms get uh, overlaid mm. and um could th could this also in any way like it, it almost that ah, here it is i got it. it it almost makes me think that uh john the baptist was replaced in the identification as the, as either the sun or the morning star himself um, in that Christian tradition, overtaking mm. uh, the Jesus tradition revelation. Mm. That's right. Uh, you know, the, the star of the East uh, symbolism comes up in the, in the uh, Bar Kokhba re revolt as well. Um, um, that symbol, that those proof texts are, are dipped into all the way through, but, in regards to with with John the Baptist again, I think it's just a case that there's uh, 
John, John is a, a movement, the John the Baptist movement comes out of Second Temple Judaism. It has to do with the, it, its motifs go all the way back to the, to the Maccabean revolt. The idea is that the temple has been polluted by collusion with the, with the foreigners. Mm -hmm. And that what you do in those circumstances is you revert back to the, effectively to the temple of nature. So you eat wild foods and so forth because the foods of the temple are, polluted um i think that 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 type of um that sort of idea john the baptist ideology continues all the way through christianity then comes along and tries to appropriate it as uh, as a as presaging the coming of christ and that there must be john the baptist followers who just resist that adaptation uh, uh who resist christianity adopting the uh the the character of john and so you get an independent john tradition that continues but i think it it, it also continues e even very deep into christianity very deep into christianity and so for instance when you get to the middle ages it's still the main heresy really because look at the the templars the templars are are, are accused of worshipping the head of john the baptist um, the the carmelites are uh, followers of john the baptist um, there's a whole bunch of groups who are followers of john the baptist clearly when the crusaders arrive in the holy land in the middle ages there's still a very strong john the baptist tradition which is either independent of christianity or semi-attached to to christianity and um i think that that's the case in the in the early period as well and uh that explains pretty much uh the appearance of john and the role of john in in those early texts and those uh movements is it possible that the because like, there I, I kind of feel like that john had his own nativity story because it was it was very similar to Jesus' mm -hmm. nativity, because an angel appears to John the Baptist's uh, father, Zechariah, then <laughs> tells him, your, your son's name shall be John. Yeah. And an angel appears before uh, Joseph, and tells him to name him Jesus. And mm -hmm. could it be that those conflicting, uh, or should I say the, dupl the, dupl the, the duplication of those uh, nativity scenes where both characters mm. played a part in creating movements like the Mandeans who fought John's a real guy he's the messiah and Jesus is nobody mm. could that have caused hell or I'm not saying that that one thing caused it but could it have poured gas on the fire yeah I think uh, certainly I think I think so and I think that that's what happens you get sort of ideas that begin and then you get uh, subsidiary material that forms around it that, that that feeds the fire and it just it becomes it develops a life of its own that's right i think that uh the mandeans are possibly a case of that it's syncretic um but it's certainly possible that that's what's added to the uh to those groups throughout the throughout i think yes does it seem from all of us that the gnostics came out of a group the the, the the marcion the gnostics could they have been or could they have been largely rooted in jews that emerged after the war ended the jewish roman war ended in about 73 a.d in the fall at the fall of masada when the jews finally came to Kuja, the temple is gone and by 73 we totally lost um because the temple was destroyed in 80 70 the second temple and do you think they were trying to rationalize why they lost the war and what they did was they created ideas. Could they have could they have created these ideas that there were two gods in Judaism? And they, they didn't realize or they thought they didn't know about before. And then Morris Young comes around and says, Oh, actually, it turns out Yahweh is a totally false god. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not how not how I how I sort of normally think of it. No. Um, I think of a, a, a different narrative here, in which the for a start. I think we tend to overemphasize the first Jewish war. Mm -hmm. We do so because we have a lot of material on that war. We have a full account of it by Josephus. 
and because it was valorized by the Flavian dynasty as their founding war, it becomes sort of the new Trojan War for the for their dynasty. Whereas, in fact, we know that um, the Jewish rebels were not defeated. They made a comeback and the Bar Kokhba revolt was even bigger than the first right. Jewish war. So within the space of one generation or, or less, they were back again and uh, they really gave the Romans a, a run. Um, so I sent, tend to think of it that it, the, these processes don't really start, the settlement processes don't really start till after the Bar Kokhba revolt. Um, although certainly there's things that happen after the first Jewish war and, and reflection must be one of them it, and recrimination, people reflecting on and recriminating about why they lost, uh, why they lost the war, why the temple was violated right, right. and right. so on. So there must have been, and that must produce a new ferment of ideas. Um, although I tend to see Marcion and uh, the development of that, that schism between the Old Testament God and the New Testament God as essentially, as essentially a manifestation of, of a very deep sort of anti-Semitism in, in, right. in, uh, in the Christian order and that, that is really taking place at this time because the, the rabbinic tradition is forming as well. And it's, it's, a, it's deliberately adopting a, uh, a sort of exilic, um, a, a diaspora form. It's, ta it's adopting a, 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 a settlement with the Romans in which, you know, they've expelled the radical literature from the canon. They, uh, they, they are, um, they've settled down into their own private uh, um, systems of worship, which are scholarly and they don't aspire to run a temple anymore. And, and so forth. Um, so while they, they move into their place, um, there's sort of a, a divorce of the material. Christianity at that point doesn't need Judaism so much anymore. It sort of can stand on its own. And so you get, uh, I think you get a, uh, that division, they get that schism, that bifurcation of the New Testament from the Old Testament. And uh, uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. I still meet, I still meet today, even uh, Christians who who say, "Yeah, we don't need the Old Testament. It's uh, we right. should have just got rid of it." Yeah. And what you were talking about earlier about the the anti-Semitism and and mm. and Marcion and the Marcionite movement, it, mm. it, it reminded me of the Gospel of John. Yep. The Gospel of John says that the Jews are the sons of the devil. Yeah. I think somewhere mm. else in the same text, actually, yes, I'm very certain of it. Somewhere else mm. in the same text, it says that the, it insinuates that the Jews are the descendants of Cain, the, because it talks yeah. about a descendant from the first murder, mm. which in the Hebrew Bible, of course, is Cain. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, that, I think that what you're seeing after the Bar Kokhba revolt and into the second century is you're seeing deliberate attempts, deliberate movements of the Christians to move away from uh, the Hebrew background to, to, uh, to, to the movement. And, and part of that is sort of the, the demonization of um, many aspects of Judaism. Right. Mm. And, that and, 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 and bifurcation, bifurcation. And it, it goes into Christology too. At this time, you get a whole a lot of movements that uh, revolve around the problem of the, the two natures of Christ. To what extent is he a man and to what extent is he a God? Is there adoptionism and so forth and so on? You get all of those sort of, um, those sort of issues as well. They're all bifurcation problems. We're bifurcating the Christianity from, from, uh, from its Hebrew background and uh, the two testaments and we're bifurcating, we're trying to make distinctions between the, the nature of Christ and uh, those sorts of things. And we're setting up, uh, uh, we're looking at, we're importing into that a lot of Hellenistic uh, dualism, 
which you know you can trace back to Plato perhaps or, or other other Greek right. thinkers. Um, but that's pervasive in the Hellenistic world in that period. And so it, 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 those structures, those uh, dualistic structures come into um, the Gnostic texts very strongly, yeah. I wanted to go back to the, the reference you made to the Trojan War earlier, the, Jews, the, 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 mm -hmm. the Jewish War was interpreted as a new Trojan War. Yeah. Um, because as, as I'm sure, um, as, as I'm sure you are aware, there's a Gnostic text um, that actually makes out Simon Magus's wife, Helen, to be the mm. reincarnation of Helen of Troy. Yes. Could this be could this be a play on the Jewish war, or could it be more like the Bar Kokhba revolt? Because there was a guy mm. called Simon that was the, the leader of mm. the Jews in that era. Yeah. Like, what are your views on yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, that's very yeah. difficult to say. The, the Bar Kokhba revolt and the first Jewish war tend to be uh, conflated in later sources. They, they're, they're all bound together as one event. Um, and, but that must happen at a distance. Uh, you know, people conflate things from a distance. Um, it wouldn't happen immediately after the Bar Kokhba revolt. But, um, but that's clearly what happens here. So it's very hard to say. Um, uh, my, my guess is that it is a reflection to the first Jewish war, because I think that the, the Flavians, um, deliberately use that motif, the, the Jewish war as the Trojan war as part of their legitimation exercise. I think that that's part of their legitimation that, uh, uh, just as the Julio Claudians trace themselves via Virgil back to the Trojan war um the the flavians couldn't do that they didn't have any credentials so they had to their, their legitimation was that they won the jewish war and so for them that becomes the um uh, that becomes like the trojan war it's the point of beginning of their dynasty and also so, josephus yeah. portrays vespasian as the messiah that's that's right. So so whenever you get reflections in any of the texts, the later texts, um, uh, into the second century and even beyond, that 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 make those connections, those reflections from the Trojan War to uh, the the Jewish War, whether it's conflated with the Bar Kokhba Bar Revolt or not, um, right. I think that that's what's going on. Yeah, and it goes all the way into. Uh, it's really spectacular and obvious in. Um, uh, medieval romance in England in the, the grail cycles and things like that. What you have there are connections to the Trojan War, but more importantly, uh, the, the role of Vespasian and, and, and so forth in, and all of, and Titus and the Flavians there make it clear that um, uh, for those romances, the Jewish war is like the famous ancient war, like the Trojan War. The connection is really obvious in that literature. So it goes all the way into into that into the Middle Ages. That motif, mm. the, the the defeat of the the defeat of the Jews was like uh, the the was like the uh, Achaean defeat of the Trojans. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, because it's, 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 that's the reason why Helen, Simon's wife, is portrayed as the reincarnation of Helen of Troy. So yeah, that I, way, I take it. That, that's why in that divine sense, mm. it's like, oh, it's a miracle. We see the Trojan War happen all over again. And yes. this time, the Romans are like the Achaean. They're replacing the yeah. Achaeans, the Greeks. And the Jews yeah. are taking over the role of the Trojans. And yeah. they're the ones getting beaten down. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And once again, you know, it's a replay of Europe versus Asia. That sort <laughs> of, uh, that sort of uh, right. broad geopolitical division uh, of things. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the Western Mediterranean versus the, the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, yeah. And now I want to get into the Gospel of Barnabas. Um, mm. the, the Gospel of Barnabas, as you know, it says Judas Iscariot was crucified instead of Jesus. Yes. Irenaeus records that the Simonians fought Simon and Cyrene was crucified instead of Jesus. Yes. yes. In those right. situations, 
Could these be reflections of different cults that thought Judas Iscariot is the real Messiah or Simon was the real Messiah, just as the Mandeans thought John the Baptist was the real Messiah? Mm. Could, could it be a, another John the Baptist Mandean scenario? No, I think what's going on there is um, in all these cases, in the Docetic uh, heresy, as it's called, uh, the Docetism, um, what's going on here is sort of the, the, a central motif of the twin and the idea of mistaken identity. That's, that's really important in, in, in this literature. And you get it in the Clementine literature as well. That's an issue there. It's about recognitions. It's about, it's about the general problem of, in the ancient world of how do you recognize someone? You know, the, 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 it's a, remarkable even the canonical gospels, the Romans don't even know what Jesus looks like. They have to say to, to Judas, you know, Judas says, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll point him out by kissing him on the cheek. That's the guy. The Romans don't even know what he looks like. And they have really no way of telling that they have the right, the right guy. They don't have fingerprints. They don't have uh, ID cards. They don't have anything like that. You've got a problem in the pre-modern world of identities. And there's a whole literature that plays with this. And it invites all sorts of things like playing with twins and mistaken identity and so on. You know, there's a whole literature that plays on this uh, in the ancient world. The recognitions literature is how, where we find it in Christian literature, but it's there in the, it's there in the canonical gospels too. The canonical gospels are playing those games about identity as well. So identities tend to be fluid and twins become very important people, don't they? Because because uh, you can't tell them apart. You can't tell who's who. And this is the story in the Gospel of Barnabas. It's a case of mistaken identity, except in this case, God punishes Judas Iscariot by making him look like Jesus. And the Romans, uh, who again, don't really know what Jesus looks like, thinks that Judas is the guy and Judas goes to the cross yelling that they had the wrong man and uh, he's, he's crucified instead of Jesus. You get this idea of the substitute. This meets uh, Muslim expectations because it says this in the Quran, not he, he didn't, he wasn't crucified, but one in his stead. They thought that they crucified him, but they didn't really crucify him. And again, it's a, it's that uh, dualistic idea that, or this idea that Jesus was, Christ was uh, too good, to suffer such a fate, crucifixion is the, the least noble of deaths. You know, it's a miserable death reserved for criminals. Um, uh, they just believe that Christ was too good to die in that way. And so you get a displacement. Well, it must have been someone else. Um, right, yeah. And you, you, you get that idea and then they build on that idea. Well, that's why they he appeared resurrected afterwards because he didn't really die. Um, and you get uh, all sorts of every possible variation on that story. It's a recognitions story. How do we know that was the right guy? Um, uh, and this goes right through uh, Docetism. And this is, this is indeed what you find in the Gospel of Barnabas. Except in the Gospel of Barnabas, it is carefully packaged as a fulfillment of uh, scripture from from hebrew scripture of, of revelations and prophecy from the hebrew scriptures so it's firmly based in proof text so in the gospel of barnabas it's really interesting because what we have there is the fullest development of a docetic reading of the hebrew prophecies and uh, he wants to show that that outcome the docetic crucifixion is a natural outcome following from the Jewish tradition. He wants to say that that is the natural theology of the Hebrew scriptures. And that's a really interesting uh, point of view that what we have here is someone who's reading the Old Testament in that way. And he shows just how, de how deeply grounded in the Old Testament and Old Testament stories that idea is of mistaken identity, uh, of, uh, of substitution. So one person being substituted for another. Um, 
uh, scapegoating. And so it's, you know, it's a very deep theme in Old Testament stuff. And the Gospel of Barnabas develops that very fully. Um, it's a bit melodramatic and it's a very written in a very medieval style. But if you leave that aside, it's actually, uh, it's actually a very interesting theology that he presents there. Mm. And the, the, the Gnostics make it look like uh, <laughs> in the Old Testament, um, Satan or Lucifer is made out to be, see, Satan or Lucifer is, is, is actually the good guy. And yeah. Yahweh is trying to make it look like that he's the bad guy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's roles right. Roles are just cool reverse in that sense role reversal role reversal and mirroring that's uh, that's typical of this literature you really need to to you know i think we need to place those sort of texts in that genre of literature that recognitions type of literature right. you know it's a it's a very um it's a very widespread literature really in the ancient world because it's such an enormous problem about how do you know someone is who they say they are um when you talk about the twins, that kind of reminded me of the Apollo and Artemis scenario in Greek mythology. These are <clears> twin <throat> deities, and and I wanted and I wanted to ask you about that because Apollo was jealous of Orion and Artemis's uh, relationship, <clears throat> and Apollo tricked Artemis into killing Orion. And Orion, in another Greek text, is described as walking on water because he was a son of Poseidon, like uh, mm -hmm. Jesus walked on water. Could the whole twin scenario, including the role reversals of Jews, Jesus, Judas, or Jesus and Simon, or Jesus and John, and these other Gnostic traditions, be uh, connected to that allegory? Oh, right. absolutely. Absolutely. I think so. Because uh, that, that interest in twins in the Semitic world, um, as, soon as, as, as soon as you latch onto that, you're going to make comparisons to the Hellenistic parallels, and there's lots of them. And then clearly, some of them have overlap into the into the into our texts, don't they? Um, uh, there are motifs from classical mythology to do with uh, twins and exactly those sorts of myths that clearly leak into our into our texts. I think that that's a, a well established sort of idea now. That, um, but but. What's interesting is that is the twin aspect of it. Yeah, that's what's really interesting. The Gospel of Barnabas develops it in an interesting way. It de develops it like this. What happens is that we're told that Jesus, uh, when, when he's not the Messiah, he's the forerunner of the Messiah in this case, but Jesus is told that uh, when he dies, he would meet God face to face. He would have the the ultimate uh, reunification with God and the ultimate felicity. But but because people call him God, and as he walks around in the Gospel of Barnabas, people say, "Oh, he's the Messiah. He's he's or he's God." Because people treat him like that because of his miracles, um, his his meeting with God is postponed. It's postponed. And so he weeps all the way through the Gospel of Barnabas. He's a weeping Jesus. He does nothing but cry, really. Um, and um, uh, that's because his reunification with God has been postponed until that blasphemy that he is the Messiah or that he is God has been eradicated from the world. And so you get, you get all of that. It's a very interesting development that the gospel of Barnabas gives to it. Um, the laments of the prophet called God. Jesus is, Jesus is presented as the prophet who was called God. And that's, that's an unfortunate fate for a prophet in, in the gospel of Barnabas. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, He's saved from the crucifixion um, and Judas is uh, punished instead. And so there's justice in the world. That's the, that's the outcome of that. Mm. 
it, and it, it kind of reminds me that uh, what, what you were just saying there about Jesus being the 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 weeping prophet. He has to be. Mm-hmm. He has that that gives that paints a bullseye on him that he's he's going to get martyred. And mm-hmm. um, in the Old Testament, they have this character called Isaiah's uh, suffering servant, and they have yes. they have the. And there is these different Jewish texts in there, however, mm. that has been, it appears to have been manipulated in, in later Christian copies of the Old Testament. Mm. Um, mm. And they say, oh, you look, look over here. He was uh, like a lion yeah, that pierced my hands and my feet. But in the original text, it says they, they, they had mauled his hands and feet. Yeah, they, and they, they've, they've backwritten about. this, yes. Yeah, they're they're accommodating Old Testament passages to to prophecy. They're, they're yeah. back writing it. Yeah, that's. I think that that's that's pretty well recognised in in textual criticism that this is a process that goes on. Um, and you know, there's always the quest get to get back to the Ur text to get back to the the purest text before all of that sort of sort of thing has been happening. Mm. The toing and froing between. Uh, redactions and and developments of textual uh, manipulation yeah mm. isaiah is particularly prone to that one so it's good to find the the great isaiah scroll in the dead sea scrolls because we could confirm the early text right yeah because in that the isaiah scroll says that oh, oh look look here emmanuel is not born of a virgin he's indeed born of a young woman alma yes not a, yeah, yeah. Not Bethlehem version. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So, so uh, that 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 discovery um, resists that whole movement to, in Christian translation and everything to obscure the meaning of that word. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Yeah. The um, I just wanted to to say about getting back to John the Baptist, leaping back there from the Gospel of Barnabas. What's happening here is that there's a secret tradition to do with John the Baptist as part of early Christianity. And what it concerns is adult baptism. That's what it concerns. And, and, and so what it, what it involves is it means that uh, there's a long neophyte period for new Christians and then they are um, a catechumenate. There's a catechumenate. They're catechumens. And then this leads up to their baptism, which happens fairly late in the piece. Um, and baptism is then analogous to resurrection in the flesh. It's a resurrection experience. This is, this is part of early Christianity, and uh, it continues... Uh, right through to the Middle Ages, and I think it's connected with the uh, the Templars and with other groups as well, and we find it in the Gospel of Barnabas. The idea is that there's a catechumenate and that you're baptised as adults in the manner of John the Baptist. The John the ba- so that it's a it's opposed to uh, infant baptism. And where we find the Gospel of Barnabas in Italy, this is the traditions of the uh, of the Church of Milan before the Counter Reformation. The idea of adult baptism. Saint Ambrose, the founder of the Church of Milan, uh, he was an archbishop and he hadn't been baptized. Adult baptism is baptism as a an initiation, as an adult initiation is. Uh, is the tradition that you find in the Gospel of Barnabas. And I think it's what sustains those uh, John the Baptist groups uh, in the Near East for throughout the centuries. That's what you find in the Carmelites and the Templars and other groups as well, the Mandeans and so forth. The idea of, there's the idea of initiation. John, the baptism of John as a form of initiation, whereas that drops out of, mainstream christianity you get infant baptism becomes norm the norm from about the third or fourth century onwards and so this displaces and drives underground that john the baptist adult baptism tradition 
And I think that that's, uh, that, that's a sort of esoteric Christianity that, that you can trace from the earliest period all the way through to the Middle Ages up until up until the Protestant Reformation, where it sort of drops out of contention, although it goes into uh, Freemasonry and things like that. It's the, I think that that's a continuous tradition to do with adult initiation. Well, okay, Dr. Rodney Blackhurst, thank you for joining me again. And I would like to have you come back on at some point. I want to do, I do want to, I want to do a show of you and Dr. Price um, yep, sure. on, on the Marcion and the dating of Paul. I want to do a full hour on, of Mount on Marcion. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah, on yeah. that. So I think I find the topic very fascinating and the, the whole yeah. deal with, with Tertullian saying that Marcion discovered Galatians. Yes. I, I find it, I just find it absolutely fascinating. I yeah, really yeah. do. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd be happy to do that. That'd be great. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.